He didn't know, but I love his answer. It's great, though, to be human. And if we're not careful, uh, our humanity will get stolen from us. In fact, uh, being human is great most of the time. There are times uh, when we have struggles, when we experience brokenness, but God ultimately didn't create us to struggle and to have brokenness. God created us to enjoy us and to have a relationship with us and so that we could live in such a way that we experience a full and a satisfying and abundant life so that there could be joy and hope in this world. And if we're not careful, when we're trying to survive the holidays, they'll become nothing but a struggle. And the holidays won't be full of the joy that God can give. And if we try to accomplish the holidays without being intentional about inviting God into that space, then we're destined for failure. So today we're going to talk about making space for God during the holidays. And I hope today's message won't just help us survive the holidays, but I hope ultimately it'll help us thrive in the middle of the holidays. And I brought with me today a, uh, my, my gear bag, and I brought with me uh, uh, some space makers. This time of year, these kind of space makers are important because what they do is they allow more people around the table. And you know, if I could have found it, I wouldn't have got one of those things you put a pizza on, you know? that lifts the pizza up so you can get stuff under it. But, but space makers tend to create more space on the table. So, for example, if, if, if you and I were, were having a meal on this table together, this would allow us to put some, some items here and still have our plates on the table. And ultimately, the space maker we're going to talk about today elevates us above the world around us. And we'll take a look at that. As I do, though, uh, I want to lean into uh, a verse of spoken word by a person named David Sorensen. And I'll, I'll give it my best effort here, but I'm sure he would do a better job. He writes this for us as we think about God's place in our life. He says, enjoy life. The Father loves us so much but sometimes he is sad because he sees how weary we are, how busy, how oppressed, and how stressed. He longs to give us rest. He longs to refresh us. He has better things for us. How can we receive it? By stepping away from the noise of the world. Seek solitude. Seek rest. Seek Peace, seek quietness, seek nature, seek stillness, laugh. Step away from the busy world, the many sounds, the opinions, the fighting, the anger and strife. Step away from it all. Seek peace, seek stillness, seek Him. He will bring refreshing to your soul. He is the source of living water. Come and drink from him, beloved. Drink his peace, his joy, his love. Don't allow the noise and restlessness of this world to blind you. TV, internet, radio, people, work, smartphones, 24-7 news, the list, the expectations, the pull of the culture. Step away from it. Do it. Please. Shake it off. Shake it off. So many of his precious children live in the tensions of this world. And they live exhausted. Tired. Angry. And stressed. He is longing for you to come into his peace. God says, I've called you to live, my child. I didn't call you to only rush 
and run and push. I've called you to enjoy me and to enjoy the good things I have for you. Your beloved ones, your family, your friends, my creation, the hobbies I gave you, what makes you happy and relaxed? Do that. It's okay. Discover what I have created for you to enjoy. I rejoice when I see you enjoy life. It makes me happy to see you smile and be whole. So enjoy life. We take those words from Mr. Sorensen and we combine them with words from Scripture. Beginning in John uh, chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus says, The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I wonder if the thief might try to steal and destroy our celebrations this time of year. I wonder if the thief might infuse those celebrations with things that don't give life but only take it. I wonder if the thief might make our holiday celebrations a burden instead of a joy. Jesus says, I've come to give them a rich and satisfying life. You know, so many times in our world, and I want to ask you what your what faith is like. So many times in our world, all we lean into is the fact that we're broken and that we need fixing. We need God's help. Right? That's all we lean into. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have a rich and satisfying life. I wonder what would happen if we leaned into having a rich and satisfying life first. Instead of second, after we're broken. Wouldn't that be part of God's plan? Well, 1 Timothy 6.21 says this. Some people have missed the most important thing in life. They don't know God. So let's talk about today. How to make room for God this holiday season. And let me say this, when we make room for God, I'm not talking about adding something to our life. When we make room for God, I'm not talking about one of many things. You see, when we make space, when we make room for God, God will order everything else. And for lack of a better illustration, it's not like just adding one egg to the carton. So now that we have a full carton, when we add God to the carton, all the eggs are ordered. All the eggs become healthy. All the eggs become nutritious. None of the eggs kill us or destroy us because we add God. We make space for God. Well, I tried to make you a little anxious last week. And if you weren't here, I'll make you a little anxious today. How many Saturdays till Christmas? Does anybody know? How many Saturdays to get to the mall or to walk by the candy cane emergency poles in front of Walmart, right? Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. More Saturdays to Christmas. And with only 168 hours in each week, are we going to be able to make it? Will our time between now and 2020 be crammed with expectations? How are we going to make it? Work, work out, a work party, a kids, a kids party, kids practice, kids presents, kids clothes, a yard, a house, a kitchen, relatives, recipes, travel, presents, decorations, parties, more parties, people, cards, cake, cookies, pets. Did you know pets have to have presents nowadays? Don't miss them. It's 
stockings, the tree, the garland, the lights, the haircut, and the credit card. Are you ready for all that? Have you made space this season for God? We got to be intentional about it or this season will slip away and God won't be involved. I want to talk about a couple of space makers today. A couple of, of ways to frame our mind and heart in making space for God. A couple of decisions that I want to invite you to make today. And the first one is this. Starting today and for the next six Saturdays at least, Decide now that you will be counterculture. Decide now that you will be counterculture. You see, Proverbs 17 24 says this sensible people keep their eyes glued on wisdom, but a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth. If we take that, sensible people keep their eyes glued on the wisdom of God. But a fool's eyes wander to the ends of the earth, picking up cues from our culture, picking up cues from everything and everybody but God. So decide now that you will be counterculture. Our culture pulls us and 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 pulls us until we get pulled apart. It pulls us with, with many things. It pulls us with expectations, for example. What's a good holiday look like? Where do you get your idea of what a good holiday looks like? What are your expectations for a good holiday season? Are they coming from the wisdom of God? Or are they coming from the pull of the culture? What's your reference point for a good holiday season? Oh, please don't tell me your reference point is from Madison Avenue. Please don't tell me your reference point might be a, a Lexus with a bow around it. And would it be a good gift if it were Lexus, but it didn't have a bow around it? I think so, but if it didn't have a bow around it, it might not meet expectations, right? Where are those expectations going? The pull of money. The pull of money this time of year is huge. I love the, the words of uh, Dave Ramsey when he reminds us of this time of year. He says, he says, Christmas comes around every December. It should not be a financial emergency. But sometimes it feels like it, doesn't it? The pull, where do the expectations of spending money at Christmas time come from? Do they come from the, the wisdom of God? Or do they come from the pull of what our culture says about our money? B, decide now to be countercultural. I don't know what your family can tolerate in that regard. Some of us don't tolerate being countercultural very well. I knew one family that only gave their children used toys for Christmas. You? Might not be a bad idea. Who's going to know if you don't tell them? Right? You know, one of the ways that we're going to attempt to be countercultural with our money at Hope is by, by giving. By giving. We'll have a tree out here with gifts for children at Murphy Harps to to help children who are in dire need of love. We'll, we'll have another opportunity to share uh, 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 the Christmas spirit and God's love with our first responders by taking a, a meal or a treat on Christmas Eve morning to them. We're also going to have our, our Christmas offering where we'd invite you to bring a gift to God this Christmas. How about that? That's countercultural. To bring a gift to God and that gift will go to benefit a uh, things like the University of Georgia uh, Wesley Student Ministry. It'll go to benefit our local fellowship of Christian athletes. It'll, it'll go to benefit a little bit uh, our Dry Butts Ministry. It'll go to visit, benefit local outreach and missions. It'll go to benefit Christmas for Cameroon. 
And in being countercultural there, I, I want to put a little seed in your mind. Um, so what are you going to spend on Christmas? What's your plan? You're like, dude, I don't have a plan. I just spend as little as possible and I always spend too much, <laughs> right? But what do you think you're going to spend on Christmas? Hundred dollars? Thousand? Two thousand? Three thousand? Five thousand? Ten thousand? Lexus? Sixty thousand? Is that, that going to be Christmas? I want to invite you to take ten percent of what you're planning on spending for Christmas for everybody else and to give that to God through our Christmas offering. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be a, a cool way for a church to be counter-cultural? And I wonder what might happen if we made that kind of room for God. I wonder how God might order the rest of the eggs. It's just an idea. Nobody's going to check. It's up to you. Then there's the pool of time. We got to decide now to be counter-cultural with our time. This season will pull and pull and pull and pull us apart with its demands. What are we going to intentionally invest in during this season? What everybody else tells us to invest in or what God might have us invest in? You'd be surprised over the years, I have heard folks say things during this time of year like, uh, Pastor, I missed you at church last Sunday but I had to finish up my Christmas shopping. I'm going to celebrate the birth of Jesus, my missing church and going to the mall. Pastor, I missed you at church, but yeah, that Christmas party just, just, just went too late. <laughs> Pastor, I missed you at church, but we had an adult sleepover. No lie. Everybody came over to the Christmas party and stayed at our house and we couldn't make it. We got to be countercultural. Nothing in our culture will tell us to worship Jesus during the holidays anymore. We've got to decide now how we're going to invest our time. The culture will pull and pull and pull until it pulls us apart. There's the pull of so many things. The pull of sexuality. The, the pull of the definition of success. The, the pull of politics. The pull of developing and leaning into an identity that has everything to do with something that's not God instead of God. Whatever it is. Jesus tells us again in, in Matthew 6. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. The pull of culture, the pull of expectations. What does God want for the season? The pull of money. How does God want us to spend our money? The pull of time. How does God want us to invest our time? You see, sometimes we don't trust God. We don't trust that God has our best intentions in life. We don't trust the words of Jesus when he said that I came to give you a full and satisfying life. And what we do is we lean into the wisdom of this world and we lean into the things that kill and steal and destroy. And then we wonder why we need fixing and we wonder why we're not experiencing the full and satisfying life. Do you hear me? You see, our hearts are naturally separated from God. The Bible tells us that, that sin entered the world in the Garden of Eden through, through Adam and Eve. And they ate of the apple and they expressed their independence from God. And we are predisposed to express our independence from God. We are predisposed to express to God that we have this, that it's our life and that we can live it and that maybe God should just leave us alone. But over and over again, that doesn't work. And we need, as human beings, to be human. We need constant supernatural intervention. We have to be intentional about God's wisdom in our life or the pull of this culture will steal and kill and destroy all of our life. Do you hear me? 
There's a dangerous theology these days that seeks to affirm personal independence as holy instead of guiding people to seek dependence upon the truth and the grace of the creator who is the source of all of life and who's the author of eternal life and who sent his son to give us a rich and satisfying life. The theology that affirms personal independence leads to death. The theology that affirms dependence on God leads to life. What's your theology? The pull of culture leads us away from God. The the pull of culture uh, makes us nothing but commodities for someone else's pleasure. Decide now that you will be counterculture. Define who you are by who you are in Christ, not by who you are by anybody else's standard. But you guys came today to talk about surviving the holidays, right? Like, God, Pastor, gee, that was heavy. We just want to survive the holidays. Well, I, I want to ask you to make two more decisions. It won't take us long with these. Decide to be countercultural, but also decide to be realistic. I want to ask you to live in your own skin. You're going to improve. Your situation is going to get better in life. We don't have any doubt, but chances are you're not going to prove that much in the next three weeks. So I want to invite you to experience this season living in your own skin. There's this old commercial of a man on a treadmill and he goes over to the treadmill and he, he gets on the treadmill and then he runs over to the scale and he, he jumps on it and he weighs and he's like, oh man, I better get back on the treadmill. And he gets on the treadmill and he runs and he runs and he runs over to the scale and he weighs and this happens. And you know what? He, he never loses any weight because he's expecting things to change too fast and he's not happy living in his own skin. And I don't want you to get on the treadmill of trying to change everything about your life or trying to deny your situation during the holidays. You have a certain life. You have a certain income. You have a certain uh, relationships around you. You have a certain relationship with your children and your parents and your spouse. You've had certain things happen this year. And you know what? They're real. And I encourage you to admit the life situation that you're in right now. It's okay. God loves you in that situation and God can bring joy into that situation and God will provide a rich and satisfying life in that situation. Your life's never been perfect and on this side of the pearly gates it never will be. Lean into who you are. Be realistic. You know one of my favorite Christmases? I was too young to know the full circumstances. But it was Christmas Eve morning, and my mom's like, put everything in the car, we're going to granddad's. And I'm like, that is awesome, I love granddad, it's Christmas, let's go see granddad. So we get in the car, and we go to granddad's, it's two and a half hours away up on Mount Eagle Mountain, and we get there, and no decorations. The house is a little disheveled. The papers are on the floor. The, the dishes are in the sink. And then we get there and we surprise him. Like, he doesn't know we're coming, right? And he's like, well, hey. And, and then his mood immediately changed. He's like, so glad you're here. And then before I know it, 30 minutes later, he's like, I gotta go somewhere. I'll be back tonight. And we spend that whole afternoon pulling decorations out of my grandfather's closet and decorating the house. We clean the dishes. We pick up the papers. We we set up the tree. We put garland on the mantel. We throw a few lights on the deck outside. And we say, Merry Christmas to Granddad when he comes back after dark. And you know what? When he comes back after dark, his car is loaded with a gift for everybody. And he doesn't bring them up or try to hide them or wrap them. He just says, come out to the car. And he starts pulling gifts out of his trunk and he gives them to me and my brother and, and, and my mom and my uncle and, and it was awesome. Do you know what I didn't know? I was just too young to realize my circumstances. That was my granddad's first Christmas without my grandma. 
And he wasn't doing that well. But instead of fighting against that, my mom accepted reality. Instead of whining and wailing and becoming depressed, my mom accepted reality. And she said, let's go to granddad's. And let's live into reality. And let's make Christmas for him. We can spend the whole season comparing. We can spend it jealous. We can spend it in isolation. So many things will get us down when we start comparing our family, our health, our children, our stuff, our experiences, our beauty. If you're not beautiful yet, give it up, right? We could spend the season saying, I don't have, I wish I had, if only, I don't deserve, I regret. Or we can be honest and know that God loves us right where we are and that God brings joy right where we are and that God brings a rich and satisfying life right where we are. And that although God can change it in three weeks, he probably won't change it in three weeks. And we can live through this season in light of God's love and grace and in light of who we are in Christ and not who the world says we're supposed to be. Sometimes people come to me at church. They say, I feel lonely at church. And I know, I typically have two responses. The first one is, I'm sorry. That's hard. It's not supposed to be that way. The second one is this. Have you tried being a blessing to somebody else? Have you tried being a blessing to somebody else? And I just want to say, if this Christmas, if you don't feel blessed, then maybe your blessing will come from being a blessing for someone else. False expectations set us up for failure. Realism sets us up for success. Realism moves us beyond competition, beyond competing with others to celebration in who God is and what God has done this time of year. We want to be that person. Proverbs 14.30 tells us a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like a cancer in the bones. Let's live in our own skin, our own life situation, our own condition this Christmas and let's allow God in it. Right where we're at. Last thing. Decide to lighten up a little. It's been a little heavy this morning. I, I, I would agree. Man, I, I want to survive the holidays. This guy's laying it down on me. Like, decide to be countercultural. Decide to be honest with who you are. But also lighten up a little. Let's just lighten up a little, right? Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Do you know what? You know what your children really want for Christmas? You know what your grandchildren really wants for Christmas? Do you know what your spouse really wants for Christmas? They want you. They want hope in your eyes. They want cheer in your voice. They want attention that you can give them and notice of how they're doing. They want your wisdom for the future. That's what they want more than anything else. And if you can add a little trinket to that, even better, right? But that's just the icing on the cake. They want you. So lighten up a little bit. There is no perfect gift, by the way. It doesn't exist. It really doesn't. Because this holiday season is not a competition. It's a celebration. So just lighten up. And that spirit, I I, want to share a a couple of... uh, 
info guide mistakes. I, you know, maybe you read inf our info guide and every now and then you notice a mistake. And, and I got to admit, these, these are a little old, but, but they, they show us how funny life can be sometimes and how sometimes we take it too seriously, you know. For example, here's a mistake in the, the info guide at a church. Uh, they said, for those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. <laughs> Anybody not know you have children? <laughs> Here's one for you. Next Sunday, now this one will be familiar to you. Next Sunday, a special collection will be taken to defray the cost of the new carpet. Those wishing to do something on the new carpet can come forward and do it then. <laughs> We're already past that Sunday, by the way. Here's one for you. This being Easter, we've asked Mrs. Lewis to come forward and lay an altar, an egg on the altar. <laughs> I, I, I'd be careful with this one, but it really was in a church info guide bulletin somewhere. It said Thursdays at 5 p.m. there will be a meeting of the Little Mothers Club. Everyone wishing to become a little mother, please see the minister in his study. Just lighten up, guys. A bean supper will be held in the fellowship hall, and music will follow, I guess. I wonder what kind of music that will be. At the evening liturgy tonight, the sermon topic will be, what is hell? Come early and listen to the choir practice. <laughs> Right? Today's sermon, how much can a person drink with hymns from a full choir? This is great, isn't it? Next Sunday, Mrs. Vincent will be the soloist at the morning service. Then the pastor will speak on, it's a terrible experience. <laughs> These are true. Potluck supper. Prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> On the church sign, don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> right? The low self-esteem self support group will meet on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Please make sure to use the back door. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I love kids. And you know, sometimes in church, we have like a kid's moment. In fact, this morning, I, one of my best memories of this morning, I was, I was downstairs and uh, I walked around, we're getting the rooms ready and the, the, the um, two little Newman girls are in there and little Summer looks up at me with her big smile. She goes, hey, Pastor Ben. And then they run over to the table and uh, they say, I'm the big sister, so I sit in the big chair. And then Summer says, I'm the little sister, so I sit in the little chair. Isn't that beautiful? Such sweet, innocent spirits. Well, there's a, a story of <laughs> Uh, here in Georgia of a pastor um, having a little children's moment in worship and um, you know we, we've done that once or twice some churches do it every Sunday but they invited the children to come up and the pastor gets down and sort of has their lesson with the children sometimes that's the only thing the adults understand you know so they 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 pay attention but uh, this particular Sunday a, a little girl is uh, late and she comes in right as they're having the children's sermon you know they're 20 minutes late to worship and the, the pastor waves her on up front says come on come on and she gets up there and the pastor says it's glad to have you how are you doing this morning and right into the mic this little girl says pastor thank you I had fun getting here but my mom said it was a <laughs> folks I'm not giving you permission to say the B word in church. Please don't. Please don't hear that. But I am saying this. Lighten up a little bit. These holidays are going to happen. 
And this culture will kill and steal and destroy everything about them. In our culture, the holidays are made for somebody else's benefit. They're made for somebody else's bottom line to be black instead of red. They're made for somebody else's joy because in our culture, the holidays are competition. But in Christ, our holidays are a celebration. And so decide now to be counterculture. Decide now to admit who you are, to be honest with who you are and live into that. And decide now to lighten up a little bit. We have six awesome weekends ahead of us. Let's don't just survive them. Let's thrive in them. Please pray with me. God, uh, we thank you that you, uh, you love us. God, we thank you that you provide more for us in this world than we can even perceive. You provide more than we can admit. And God, I pray that for each of us here, Lord, that we would be intentional in the weeks ahead. Not looking around seeking the wisdom of this world, but seeking your wisdom. Not allowing the thief to come in and steal, but allowing you to come in to give a rich and satisfying life and a rich and a satisfying holiday season. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.